All right, I believe we are live. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our, our monthly public lecture. Very happy to introduce uh, tonight's speaker, uh, Tim Halleck, who's a grad student at the McGill Space Institute. Uh, Tim studies exoplanets and interstellar objects, and that's what he'll be telling us about tonight. Uh, as usual, if you have any questions, you can feel free to post them either in the Facebook live stream chat or the Zoom chat. We'll be monitoring your questions, and I'll be asking Tim your questions at the end of the talk. Your name will never appear on the live stream, so no worries about that. Uh, so without any further ado, Tim, take it away. Okay, um, thanks, Simon, for the nice introduction. So like Simon said, I'll be talking about um, our galactic neighborhood tonight. And what that means exactly, I'll get into in a few slides. But for now, suffice to say, what I mean by that is um, exoplanets, so planets in other solar systems around other stars and interstellar objects. And what exactly those are, I will also make more clear uh, in, in other slides. So to start things off, um, here's an image of um, a spiral galaxy, not unlike our own spiral galaxy that we reside in, the Milky Way. This is not the Milky Way. Of course, we can't take a picture of our own galaxy because we're inside it. This is a different spiral galaxy. Uh, this is an image from Hubble. So this is a collection of something like uh, 400 billion stars all orbiting um, the galactic center in the middle. Uh, the galactic center is a region with this very, very high number density of stars. There's spiral arms, right? Everyone's seen pictures like this. There's beautiful spiral arms. We reside somewhere uh, along one of these spiral arms in the Milky Way. And if you'll allow me, I'm gonna uh, overlay a plot, a graph basically. Um, it's more of a map of the spiral galaxy that we live in. Um, so this is a, a map version of that image. So what we've done here is we've, we've overlaid some, some distances here. We've, we've labeled spiral arms so we know where we are in the galaxy. So we've got the Sagittarius arm, the Perseus arm. The sun is in the Orion spur spiral arm. So it's a small spiral arm in the uh, bottom of the screen here. The sun is labeled. So we're right in the middle of this spiral arm. That's where we are. Um, in the galactic context. So I've zoomed in even, um, even more here. So this is a zoomed in version of, of what I just showed you surrounding the sun. And here's the Ryan Spur again, right? This is our home spiral arm. The Perseus arm is outside. It's a much larger spiral arm. And uh, this region that I'm showing here is pretty much everything I'm going to be talking about, exoplanets and interstellar objects, everything that we've learned in the past uh, 10 years or so about all these fascinating subjects has really come from studying this very small corner of the galaxy that we reside in. So just to give you some perspective, about uh, two inches on your home computer screens, on your monitors, is a distance on this image of about um, 3,000 light years, something like that. And light travels at something like a billion kilometers an hour. So a light year is how long it, how the distance it takes uh, light if it travels for a year at that, at that speed, a billion kilometers an hour. So that's a very large distance, one light year. So two inches on your screen is about 3000 light years. So that's kind of the, the scale we're talking about here. So still very large, but in the galactic context, this is a kind of a small region surrounding our own little um, neighborhood of the galaxy. Okay, so I'm sure everyone knows about the solar system. Um, so I've zoomed in again to our backyard this time. We've come from our neighborhood in the galaxy to our backyard, the solar system. So here's the sun on the center, the, the, the left part of your screen here, right? There's the inner planets, Mercury and Venus, Earth, right? The big uh, blue marble, Mars in red, the giant planet, Jupiter. There's Saturn with its beautiful ring systems and the cool planets at the outer distances of the solar system, Uranus and Neptune. So everyone knows about um, our own planets and for pretty much the entirety of human existence, everything we knew about planets, how they form, what they look like comes from studying our own planets, right? Um, so this is a quote from Isaac Newton more than 300 years ago. If the fixed stars are the centers of similar systems, they will all be constructed according to a similar design. This is Newton writing uh, more than 300 years ago about other star systems and other planetary systems. Of course, what he thought was that they should all form the same way because we know how gravity works and gravity shouldn't change depending on where you are in the galaxy or the universe. Uh, so this is kind of the prevailing opinion, especially in science. I mean, even up until the 1980s, like I said, these were all the planets we knew about. And if we wanted to understand how planets form or what they look like, this was the only way to study it, was to study your own planets in your own backyard. 
So it wasn't until the 1980s or the 1990s that uh, technology advanced to the point where we could really start to uh, discover other planets around other stars, not just our sun. So what I'm gonna show you here is um, kind of the, the most intuitive way to understand how people might um, discover other uh, planets around other stars. So if you ask someone on the street, um, you know, how do you think people discover planets? The most intuitive way and probably the easiest thing to understand is just that you point a big telescope at a different star in the galaxy. And if you wait long enough, maybe you'll see a planet in your telescopic image, right? That's kind of, that's very easy to understand. It's kind of like Galileo here. This is the image I'm showing, this is Galileo. It's basically what he did when he was studying the moons of Jupiter or the rings of Saturn. You just look with your telescope and see what you see in your telescopic image and you study it from there. And this is what we call um, direct imaging. It's kind of in the name, right? It's directly imaging other planets around other stars. And the image on the right here is um, an extrasolar system, an exoplanetary system, a different star in the galaxy called HR8799. Uh, and it's a movie, which I'm gonna show you very soon. And actually this work was done by a Canadian group uh, led by Christian Marois from uh, University of Victoria. And what they're doing here is they're pointing a big telescope at the star HR8799 for a long time, and they just see what happens uh, in their telescopic image. So this is a movie. This is just straight from their telescope. So the star is at the center, and you can see these, uh, you know, th there's planets, right? These are extrasolar planets that they're directly imaging in real time as they orbit another star in the galaxy. So that's what they're, that's what these points of light are. This is thermal emission from other planets. And at the end of the video here, you can see there's about six planets that show up in the image frame. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, so there's six, we know there's six planets on uh, orbiting HR8799. The, the, the dark spot in the center is because um, in order to see these planets, you have to take out starlight from the center of your image, which can contaminate the rest of the image. The star is very bright. And so if you wanna see planets orbiting the star, the, the starlight can make it very difficult to discover other planets orbiting the star. So you have to filter that out. That's why the center is dark here. And this also means that in this um, method of imaging, you can't see planets that are very close to the central star because it's too bright. There's too much light here otherwise, right? You can, you can kind of hardly see uh, these, these other planets because the starlight is so bright. So that's what this scale here, uh, 20 AU on the bottom here. That's uh, an AU is the distance between the sun and the earth. So 20 AU is roughly what these planets are orbiting at. So it takes them um, hundreds or thousands of, of, of years to actually, or thousands of, of, um, yeah, of years to, to orbit the central star. The Earth takes 365 days to complete one revolution. And these planets take much, much longer because they're very, very far out uh, relative to the orbit of the Earth. These are all giant planets as well. So you can, you can analyze these pictures and you can figure out uh, what the masses of these planets are. It turns out there's something like Jupiter, hundreds um, hundreds and hundreds of Earth masses large. So that's the first uh, way to, to detect um, other planets orbiting other stars. The second way is what we call uh, the radial velocity method. This is also a very important method. Um, so the idea here is, as I'm going to show in this video in the top right hand corner, stars and planets, uh, they, they don't, um, they, they both orbit what's called the center of mass. So they both fall towards the center of mass between the two bodies. Typically the star is very, very, very much larger than the planet that's orbiting it. So the star doesn't move very much, but there is some movement, right? You can, you can see that the star is moving uh, maybe a little bit. The planet is certainly moving more. It's, that's why we say planets orbit stars, but both are moving relative to the center of mass, which is somewhere between these two bodies. And the reason why that's important is because as the star moves, emission from the star, light from the star shifts in frequency. So that's what I'm showing in this, in this um, image here. So the star is, is the, the, the big, big body here that's rotating in a circle. The exoplanet is orbiting the star. The star is moving periodically closer to you and further away from you along your line of sight uh, because of the gravitational nudges from this exoplanet. And as it does that, as it moves further and further away and closer to you along your line of sight, the starlight gets shifted in frequency, right? Towards the blue or towards the red, depending on um, which direction the star is moving relative to you. And so if you stare at a star long enough, with enough precision, if you're very patient, you can, um, you can detect these, these very small shifts in the frequency of the starlight over time. And from that, you can deduce that there must be a planet orbiting it, if there is, and what the mass of the planet must be to induce a shift of, of the size that you measure. 
so the planet is nudging on the star, the star is moving closer to you and away from you periodically. And if you measure that with enough precision, you can deduce what mass of the planet there must be, or if there is a planet there at all. And this, the reason why this is important is because it's one of the, um, the really early and the most important um, first ways of discovering planets. So actually in 1988, a team, a Canadian team of astronomers from uh, UBC and U Victoria, they actually discovered the first exoplanet. It wasn't official, there were other sources of noise and they, they couldn't make a, a really 100% um, clear detection of a planet. They, they said it's possible it's a planet, it could be something else. Uh, but it turns out in 2002, their discovery was um, vindicated and actually it, was, it turned out it was a, a real uh, planet, a bona fide planet. But at the time they couldn't say for sure it was a planet. So it seemed like there was a planet, but we weren't sure. <clears throat> and in 1995, a few years later, um, a team, uh, Mayer and Kellogg's used the same method, the radio velocity method, to detect uh, the first bona fide definitive planet called 51 Peg B. Uh, so they won the Nobel Prize for that, Mayer and Kellogg's did in, in 2019. But it, it, technically they weren't the first to discover a planet uh, orbiting a solar type star. That was really the team from University of British Columbia that did that. <clears throat> so that's an interesting um, kind of factoid there, Canadian astronomy history uh, fact. Okay, so that's one way to do it. That's, that's another way to discover planets. There's another way, and this is called the transit method. This is a very important method um, because uh, most of the planets that we know of right now have been discovered through this method. <clears throat> and the idea is very simple. Again, you stare at a star with your telescope, like you always do. You just point your big telescope at a star and you wait to see if a planet crosses in front of the star along your line of sight. So I'll, I'll play the movie here. So here's our star that we're staring at with our telescope. There's a planet orbiting the star and it crosses in front of the star and the star's brightness dips, right? Because the planet is blocking light along your line of sight that comes from the star. Of course, like you, you, see, you see here, there's, there's small planets that have a small dip and a giant planet, like a Jupiter sized planet, hundreds of earth masses um, can absorb much more sunlight so that the brightness can uh, dip. And so you can get a lot of information from this uh, method. You can get the radius of the planet, right? Because the amount of brightness that the, 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 uh, the size of the dip in brightness depends on how big the planet is, right? So the large radius has a large decrease in brightness. You can also tell uh, maybe what's going on in the clouds of these planets, because as light gets filtered through uh, the surface of these planets as they orbit, it's kind of like an eclipse, right? So a, or a sunset maybe is a better example. So you, at sunset, you see the sun um, kind of on the edge of the Earth's atmosphere, right? And it becomes kind of orange because the sunlight is getting filtered through the clouds and the, the, uh, the chemistry of the Earth's atmosphere. And we can do the same thing in principle with the transit method. So light gets uh, sent from the star, it's emitted, it passes through the clouds of the planet that we're seeing in the, orb, in the uh, transit. And we can uh, analyze that light and figure out maybe what kind of chemicals run uh, in the cloud surface of these planets. <clears throat> so there's another variation of the transit method uh, that's also very important. And this is what's called uh, transit timing variations. And so uh, through this method, we can find planets that are not um, seen directly through transits. We can deduce that there must be other planets that are not transiting based on how the transits change in time. So the image here that the video I'm showing is we're, we're timing a transit. <clears throat> so there's a planet orbiting the star, it's transiting. Last time it took an hour to transit. This time it takes another hour. Okay, we're gonna watch it transit again. Time how long it takes. It takes an hour, okay, no surprise. So this is very regular, right? We can time a transit. If there's no other planets, it should transit roughly at the same um, frequency um, through time. But if we add a second planet, let's say there's a second planet that's exterior to the planet that we just saw transiting, but this planet doesn't transit. Maybe it's not along our line of sight. So we're seeing it from a different angle and it doesn't pass in front of the star as we see it. Uh, and so that this planet is orbiting outside of the other planet. The inner planet is transiting and we're gonna time how long it takes again. So this, this last transit took about 50 minutes. This next transit is gonna take, uh, let's see, an hour and 10 minutes, okay. Remember, we're not seeing the outer planet. And what that one took 50 minutes again, the inner planet's gonna transit, uh, what time is it again? It's gonna be an hour and 10. Okay, so there's variations in the periodicity, the duration of time between transits, right? It took 50 minutes and an hour and 10 minutes, 50 minutes, hour and 10 minutes. So that's the idea behind transit timing variations. It's really the gravitational perturbations, the nudges from the outer planet that, that, um, that shift the timing of the transit um, periodically. And so depending on how the frequency or the, the, 
the periodicity changes, how, how frequently you see the transit, there might be one planet that perturbs the transiting planet, there might be two, uh, they might have different masses. You can determine these things just by analyzing how the duration and the timing between transits changes through time. That's very important because if you have a transit and you're lucky enough to see it multiple times, um, you can get a lot more information out than just information on that one transiting planet if there's other planets orbiting in the same um, planetary system. Okay, so there's another method. Um, uh, this is the last method I'll talk about for de detecting extrasolar planets. This is what's called uh, microlensing. And so Einstein's theory of gravity tells us that gravitational fields bend light. That light gets bent around gravitational fields. And I'll show you what that means in this video. So the idea here is we stare at a star like we always do somewhere in the galaxy. We just point our telescope at a star and we wait for a different star, maybe with a planet orbiting it, to pass in front of that star, to, to pass in front along our line of sight. So I'll pause the video. This is the star we're staring at, this background star. And this star, which has a planet orbiting it, the yellow star, this star passes in front along our line of sight. So it, it blocks the starlight from the background star. And what that does is it lenses the background light from the star we were previously looking at. So the diagram here is that the star we were staring at before the microlensing event, this is the star and this is, this is our telescope. There's a star and planetary system in between where we're, look where we are and where the background star was. And the gravitational field of the, uh, what we call the foreground star bends the, the starlight from the background star. And so what happens is you get a ring structure. So light is getting sent from the background star. It gets bent around the gravitational field of the star in the middle. And it looks like a ring according to um, our telescopic images. And the reason why that's important is because this, this is what's called um, magnification brightening. So that the plot on the left side here um, is really the brightness as a function of time. So on the bottom, I'm showing a different video. This is what a real transiting event probably looks like. So you're not gonna see a ring of light, just, you just see kind of a brightening, right? It gets brighter once the foreground star passes in front of the background star. <clears throat> And from that brightening, you can deduce that there must there could be a planet uh, orbiting the foreground star. And so the, the, the graph on the bottom of the screen is a graph of the brightness as a function of time. And you can see there's, there's structure here, right? It gets brighter once the lensing happens. It gets brighter now. And there's all kinds of spikes, right? There's a spike before, there's a spike after, there's another spike after. So these, these small little um, increases in the brightness due to magnification of the, of the starlight from the background star can tell you that there's a planet orbiting the star in the foreground. And the planet's gravity itself actually has a smaller lensing effect. So there's a star which bends light. If there's a planet around that star, that also bends the background star light. So both of these things need to be taken into account and you can measure how the brightness changes as a function of time and figure out what the planet mass might be, what its orbital distance could be. Uh, yeah, there's lots of information you can get from microlensing. And the reason why this is important, it's gonna be very, very important actually in the next decade is because um, NASA's next huge major exoplanet mission is going to be using the microlensing technique to discover planets uh, in the galaxy. And I'll get into more of that um, in the next couple of slides. Okay, so we have lots of ways of discovering exoplanets so far, right? There's four. Um, and really the exoplanet revolution happened back in 2009, once Kepler launched, or, or NASA launched what's called the Kepler spacecraft. So NASA launched Kepler in 2009. It basically pointed Kepler, as I'm showing in the uh, bottom left image here, basically pointed Kepler along the Orion spur spiral arm in the galaxy. So just pointed it in a fixed direction. Roughly, actually, the image that I showed you earlier of the solar neighborhood, basically the, the, the extent of that is where Kepler looked. It's about 3000 light years across its field of view. It basically just, just stared in that direction at different stars and waited for transiting events to happen. So that's when, like I said, the planet crosses in front of the star and you see a dip in the star's brightness. And maybe you can infer that there's other planets based on the transit timing variations, right? Um, so in the video I'm showing in the top right um, hand corner, we're zooming into the Milky Way. Here's the sun in the, in the Orion Spur spiral arm. And this is the field of view of Kepler. It's just staring along the spiral arm, 3000 light years um, across into the galaxy and it's waiting for transits to happen. And it's recording all the data. This is what it did for, from 2009 to 2018. This is the Kepler um, 
this is the Kepler instrument actually on the bottom of the telescope. It was launched in space, right? So there's a huge mirror inside. And it discovered something like 3,000 transiting exoplanets just in that small field of view, just in this 3,000 light year across um, field of view. And so what that did to exoplanetary science was revolutionize the field because we have thousands of planets before we had maybe a couple hundred, right? Um, so there's many, many more planets now, um, all thanks to Kepler. So thanks to Kepler, uh, like I said, the field has uh, been revolutionized. We know of many, many um, planets orbiting other stars, thousands at this point. And there's a few key takeaway points. Um, basically what Kepler did was it launched what the field uh, is now referred to as exoplanet demographics. So just like demographics is a study of human populations and the statistical distributions of humans, uh, we can do the same thing, but with exoplanets, right? There's different kinds, there's different distributions there. There's different trends. And so really the state of the field now is that um, Kepler surprised us in a number of ways. I think the major surprise was that it completely rewrote how we think about um, what the distribution of planets are. And the takeaway point is that the vast, vast majority of planets that Kepler discovered just in the, the solar neighborhood, right? Just in that 3000 light year cube surrounding the solar system uh, is that the vast majority of them are what are called super earths. So that's what I'm showing here. This, this, this planet is earth and this is a super earth. It's larger than earth. And the vast majority of planets are super Earths and sub Neptunes. So these are planets that are maybe a few times the radius of the Earth. So maybe they're three Earth radii large, and they're a couple Earth radii large in mass. So maybe they're four Earth, Earth masses, something like that. Maybe there could, they could be 10 Earth masses, but the point is that they're everywhere. These things are ubiquitous. The numbers work out to um, something like one per solar type star. Um, so these things are, are virtually everywhere in the galaxy. Uh, so that it's strange because the solar system doesn't have a super Earth or sub Neptune. So the solar system seems like an outlier in that sense. Um, a lot of star systems seem to have super Earths and sub Neptunes, these kind of uh, rocky, but, but they have large atmospheres. Earth has barely any atmosphere in exoplanet terms. These planets have large hydrogen atmospheres. They seem to be everywhere in the galaxy, but the Earth or the solar system doesn't have one, which is strange. Uh, another surprise that uh, maybe not Kepler so much, but other, other missions have um, discovered is the, the hot Jupiter. So this is the planet uh, in black and red that I'm showing. In blue, this is just a gas giant. So this is like Jupiter. A hot Jupiter is similar to our own Jupiter. So hundreds of Earth masses large, really, really massive planets, but they're on extremely small, short, orbits. So imagine putting Jupiter, which is at um, five times the distance of Earth from the, from the sun right now, imagine moving that all the way in to where it orbits the sun in something like one day. So that's how close it is um, to the sun if it were a, a hot Jupiter. So it's extremely hot. So the, the sunlight is extremely hot. It heats up the atmospheres, so unbelievable temperatures. The tidal interaction, the tidal forces from the, from the gravitational influence of the sun at those distances, those tiny, tiny distances, is extreme. Uh, there's all kinds of really extreme physics going on with hot Jupiters. So that's a really um, strange demographic of planet. We've known about them for a little while, but they're, they're very strange. Um, so that's interesting. And another interesting thing that we've learned in the past uh, maybe five years is um, from a telescope called ALMA. So this is what I'm showing in the orange figure here. ALMA is a telescope that looks um, at protoplanetary disks. So Planets are born in what we call disks, protoplanetary disks. And these are disks of gas and dust that orbit stars. Um, this is what I'm showing in, in orange here. And Alma is looking at these disks in unbelievable detail. So this, this star in the center, this is the, the orange circle in the center, and it's surrounded by what looks like concentric rings of gas and dust, right? So there, there's some structure here that Alma is picking up. This has never before seen without Alma. Um, so we can see dust rings. There's, there's some debate about whether Maybe these dust rings are carved out by planets or, or other things going on in the disk. We don't really know exactly what produces these rings, but it's beautiful. I mean, there's, there's such structure here and it's amazing. I mean, Alma is literally staring at um, the birthplaces of planets in real time, the birthplaces of other worlds um, in real time. And there's a whole variety of different disk structures that Alma has seen. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. And that's another really um, revolutionizing discovery that's been made the structure of protoplanetary disks where planets are born um, 
is so intricate and detailed. It's really amazing. So this is just a sample, a very small sample of some of the amazing insights that we've learned in the past 10 years um, about how planets might form or just what they look like. We didn't even know about um, super Earth and sub Neptunes until Kepler launched. So we had no idea that the universe was filled with these things uh, before Kepler. So that's, that's kind of the, the takeaway here. The solar system seems strange. We don't have a super Earth or sub Neptune. Um, yeah, it's very, it's kind of a surprise, right? The solar system shouldn't be special per se, but it doesn't have these very, very common planets, um, which is strange. So with all this gorgeous um, observational data that's been collected and these amazing discoveries, uh, it's been a really fertile ground for rethinking how planets form. Because now that we know thousands of other planets outside of the solar system, it seems like our old ideas about how the solar system form maybe don't apply as a rule to the rest of the galaxy. It doesn't seem to fit um, what we've discovered with Kepler. So uh, I'll just outline a few really uh, important results that we've learned. The first is the role of atmospheric mass loss on exoplanets. So in the picture on the bottom left, I'm showing an example of atmospheric mass loss. This is a star, that's the big orange ball of plasma. And there's a planet orbiting the star very close in. This could be a hot Jupiter, right? Very close into the central star. It's not to scale, but... And what the star does is it heats up the planet's atmospheres. The very, very high energy photons from the star heat up the planet's atmospheres. And it launches a wind, what we call a wind, which drives mass out, out of the planet's atmosphere into space. And you can shrink planetary radii like this. They can lose lots and lots of mass depending on the mass of the planet and how close they are to the sun. And the reason why that's important is because um, the theory of atmospheric mass loss has really been um, one of the most successful or most important um, results from planet formation theory in the past couple of years. So the plot I'm showing on the right, this is what's called the radius valley, the Kepler radius valley. And it's a very simple plot. What we're plotting is on the y-axis, the number of planets. So how common the planets are. And the x-axis is the size of the planet. So the size of the planet at one here, this is one earth radius. Okay, that's where we have earth. And as you move to larger radii, so this is 1.5 and this is 2.5 here, Kepler 22D is at 2.5. As you move to larger sizes, there seem to be two preferred sizes of exoplanet, right? There's a peak at about 1.5 Earth radii. And there's another peak at about 2.5 Earth radii. And there's a real dip. There's a valley between 1.5 and 2 Earth radii. So there's some kind of preferred planet size that Kepler has discovered. And it turns out you can explain this um, rather well from the atmospheric mass loss theory. So this is really one of the success stories of planet formation theory in the past couple of years. It actually predicted this valley should exist in the data. And lo and behold, a few years later, it did. It picked it up uh, beautifully. So this is really one of the most interesting uh, results. The fact that actually we're kind of, it seems like at least that area of planet formation is on the right track. It predicted this feature. It is there. And it's amazing that um, we can now, we now know that there's two preferred sizes of exoplanet um, in the galaxy. That's pretty amazing. There's a few other things that people think about when they think about planet formation theory. Um, one is uh, what's called orbital migration. So how do you move planets, planets um, away or closer to their central stars? There's lots of ways to do that. And that's important for planet formation theory. There's also the problem of core formation. So we know planets have cores, right? The earth has a core, but we don't know how, we don't know how they form out of the protoplanetary disk. So there's all this gas and dust and somehow you need to go from tiny little micron sized dust particles to huge, maybe multiple earth mass rocks um, of, of, of lava and stuff. Um, so you need to span many, many orders of magnitude and size um, when you're forming cores from dust. And that's an unknown problem. That's a very difficult problem to solve, but we've, people have really started to think about it um, since Kepler. So these are all kind of flavors of planet formation theory and things we've been, um, we've started to think about since Kepler has revolutionized our understanding of what kind of planets out, uh, exist out there. So looking to the words, the future, Kepler did an amazing job, right? It basically um, gave birth to the field of exoplanet demographics. It basically jump-started the field from scratch almost. But the future is even more interesting, I think. So this is a plot um, of where different telescopes can identify planets, where they can discover planets. So on the y-axis is the size of the planet again in, in mass this time. So one Earth mass, this is where Earth, this is, this is the one Earth mass here. On the x-axis is the planetary orbital distance. So how far away the planet is 
compared to its host star, where it orbits. So Earth orbits um, at what we call one AU in orbital distance. That's the distance from sun from the sun to the Earth. That's one AU. And Earth is one Earth mass large. That's why we put it here. Kepler is in red. So Kepler could see planets that are closer into their central star than Earth. So maybe something like Venus, which is with a smaller orbital distance from a star. And you can see planets that are Earth size and, and larger, right? You can go up to maybe 100 Earth masses or 1,000. Kepler can see them, no problem. But what Kepler can't see, this is where the, the vertical red line is, Kepler can't see planets that are further away than Earth. Kepler, Kepler can't see planets that are at 10 AU orbital distance. So the distances are 10 times larger than Earth's. Kepler can't see those planets. But the new telescope from NASA, the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, which will be launching hopefully in the next 10-ish, five to 10-ish years maybe, um, will basically complete the planet census that, we've, that Kepler began. So, so Roman is in blue here. And Roman can see, as you can see, Roman can see planets that are smaller than Earth in mass. And it can see planets that are all the way out to 100 AU. And it can see planets that are Earth mass and even larger smaller orbital distances. So this is really the, the picture that we're going to have after Roman completes its census. We're going to go pretty much the entirety of um, the planet population, hopefully, will be covered by Roman and Kepler together. So we're going to have a full picture of what the exoplanet distribution in the galaxy looks like, um, maybe in 10-ish years or 15 years, whenever Roman um, really starts giving us results. So that's gonna happen soon. That's really exciting in my opinion. That's gonna completely, um, again, completely revolutionize how we think about planets, I, I would imagine. So this is an image just showing what Roman is gonna do. So here's Roman and the, um, the spiral arm that we live in. And it's gonna look basically straight into the center of the galaxy, what we call the bulge, where there's many, many, many stars. And it's just gonna look and wait for micro lensing events. So Roman, the reason why it's so sensitive and so much uh, has a, such a larger, field of vision than Kepler is because it's going to use gravitational microlensing to find these exoplanets. Uh, so instead of transiting planets, the microlensing gives you much, much larger field of view uh, in terms of what you can discover. Um, so that's what Roman is going to do. And that's, that's, that's where it's going to look, right, near the galaxy. That way you have a very good chance of finding lots of stars crossing your field of view and telling you if there's a planet there or not based on the microlensing signature. Uh, so that's just going to happen in the next maybe five or 10 years. That's very exciting in my opinion. Okay, so I'm going to switch tracks a little bit here. So I've talked about uh, exoplanets and the amazing things we've learned about exoplanets in the past couple of years. Uh, the next thing we'll talk about are uh, what are called interstellar objects. And these are kind of related to exoplanets. We've also learned about them just from studying our galactic neighborhood. And uh, before I talk about interstellar objects in, in particular, I'll talk about inter, uh, asteroids and comets. So asteroids and comets, you probably all know about them. Um, they're leftovers from the planet formation process. So these are um, icy bits of rock that um, are left over from when you form planets in a protoplanetary disk. So they're left over. And it's, it's very easy, well, it's not easy, but it's uh, very plausible that you can eject many, many interstellar asteroids and comets out of a planetary system. So you have planets that form in a disk and the leftover material can be ejected, gravitationally ejected from a planetary system, usually through some kind of nudge from a giant planet, a gravitational nudge. So you can eject it out of the planetary system. And when it leaves a planetary system, it's just going to be free floating through the galaxy, right into interstellar space. Uh, so we've discovered two of these objects so far. One's called 1i Amuamua. 1i means the first interstellar. It's a new classification of, of um, astronomical body. And Oumuamua is a Hawaiian term. It's kind of a strange name, but it's Hawaiian. And it means uh, something like messenger from afar. And the reason why it's Hawaiian is because it's the Pan-STARRS telescope, which I've shown on the right here. This is on a, a mountaintop in Hawaii. It was this telescope that discovered Oumuamua. And actually, a Canadian astronomer discovered Oumuamua, another Canadian astronomy fact. It was actually a Canadian astronomer that um, was the first to discover this interstellar, this interstellar object. We've also discovered another one, 2i Borisov. Borisov is the name of the amateur astronomer who discovered it. This is a comet. And we're gonna have many, many more interstellar um, objects passing through the solar system. So what happens is these objects are traveling through the galaxy. They randomly, by chance, they, um, they pass close to the sun, our own solar system. And then as they pass through the solar system, we can image them with telescopes from Earth's surface. And we can see them um, 
we can study them as they pass through our own backyard, so to speak. And we're going to have many more of these because uh, a new telescope, the Vera Rubin telescope, is going to be coming online in the next couple of years. I think maybe in five years, I don't, maybe even less than that. And it's going to be able to discover many, many more of these interstellar objects. So that's very exciting. We're going to have hundreds of these things um, in a very short amount of time. So I've, I've, what I'm going to show you here is a, a video from a recent paper, um, which is a, this is a computer simulation of the solar system as of last summer from uh, I think August of 2020. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to backtrack through time, backwards in time, um, backward in, from the solar system in the present day to about the year 2000, and I'll show you the paths of these interstellar objects uh, before they hit the solar system, before they pass through our own backyard. So here's Jupiter. This is a rather large orbit from Jupiter. The sun is at the center. The Earth and Moon system are, are pretty close in. There's Mars a little bit further out. Jupiter's here, like I said. Even further out are Uranus and Neptune on their very large, long orbits. Borisov, the, the second interstellar object we discovered, is here. This is the tra trajectory that we've plotted. And Amuamua, you'll see um, soon when I play the video where it um, where it was in the past. So I'll just play the video. We're, we're going back in time now, right? Amuamua gets deflected, gravitationally deflected from the sun. Going back in time, we're five years ago in the past now. I'll pause it. This is Saturn here, right? We're going backwards. We're zooming out away from the solar system. The next thing we're going to show in the, in the video is um, the galactic plane relative to the solar system. So the, we're in the galaxy, right? We're in the Orion arm, Orion spiral arm. We're going to zoom out in the video to show where we are relative to the galactic plane. What that means is the galaxy is kind of like a, a disk, right? It's like a pancake almost, and we're some distance above the disk. And the, the galactic disk I'm showing is in checkered. So we're kind of some distance above the plane. Oumuamua is very far out now, right? We're in the year 2000. So Oumuamua is about 100, uh, 100 AU away from the solar system at this point. So 100 times further away from the sun than the Earth is right now. Borisov is quite far away. The galactic plane is this checkered, right? Like I said, we're about, uh, we're some distance above it. We're oriented relative to the galactic plane on, on some angle. And we've also shown Pioneer and Voyager. These are kind of satellites, right, from, from NASA that have been launched um, that are traveling um, away from the solar system right now. So that gives you an idea of what happens here. They're just free floating through the galaxy. They interact with the solar system. If they're close enough, like Oumuamua was, it gets deflected, gravitationally nudged uh, into some other direction. The reason why uh, Oumuamua and, are, and Borisov are so interesting, partially, is because uh, they're very different objects. They're both interstellar, which is interesting to, to start out. But they looked very different in our telescopes. So on the left is a muamua, an artist's conception of a muamua, basically a rock, right? It has some kind of pancake shape here. Uh, we don't have a, a direct, we do have direct images, but you can't see the actual shape based on the images. Borisov, this is an image on the right. This is from Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope. It looks like a comet. There's a huge cloud of gas screaming behind it as it gets heated up by the sun. And I'm going to show you next two images from comets in our own solar system. This is uh, Comet Lovejoy, for example, on the bottom right. They basically look identical to Comet Borisov on, in, in here. They both look the same, right? Huge, what we call comas, huge um, off-gassing happening as, as the comet heats up near the sun. Beautiful tails. But Oumuamua does not have that. So that's strange. That's interesting. Um, I won't get into too many details. It's kind of, um, I'm running low on time. But suffice to say, they're very interesting and different objects because Borisov seems very much like an ordinary comet, and Oumuamua does not. Oumuamua seems very strange, uh, strange shape. There's no off-gassing. Doesn't seem to be a comet. Um, kind of weird. So that the last thing I'll talk about is um, kind of the future of interstellar objects. Like I said, Kepler did a great job of revolutionizing planets. Ro Nancy Grace Roman will do an even better job. And the Gaia Space Telescope, which I've shown on the left here, is, is doing a great job at revolutionizing the study of the galaxy, not exoplanets, but just the galaxy itself and stars in the galaxy. And the reason why that's important is because Gaia, what's Gaia doing? Uh, Gaia is basically staring at different stars in the galaxy and it's measuring their position and it's measuring their velocity. That's the only thing it does for a living. It measures those two things. For billions of stars, it's going to be a, yeah at least a billion stars that's going to have full information on where they are right now and where they're going in terms of their velocity. So what's really exciting and kind of fun to think about, I think, um, is maybe uh, the possibility of figuring out maybe speculatively where interstellar objects might come from if they come from close by in the galactic neighborhood. So the video I'm showing is the solar system in red. This is Oumuamua and Borisov. 
right? This is the direction, this arrow is a direction to galactic center and the plane, the galactic plane is the checkered uh, surface. So we're zooming out away from the solar system. And uh, what you're gonna see here is a, a very, very small sample of the stars that Gaia has recorded, has measured their positions and their velocities. So this is only like, I think maybe a few hundred stars out of billions that Gaia will um, discover and measure. So we're zooming out. These are all stars that are surrounding the solar system in the galaxy from Gaia, a very, very small sample. So you can imagine backtracking an interstellar object through time to figure out maybe where it came from. So this is the path of Oumuamua back in the past in Borisov, right? This is where they came from, their directions of origin. As we zoom out, you can imagine just looking backward in time to figuring out where a star was in the past and where, where um, Oumuamua was in the past. So you, you can imagine uh, figuring out possibly where interstellar objects come from. The reason why that's important is because they're literally bringing pieces of other star systems to the gap, to the, uh, to the solar system, right? So if an interstellar object passes through the solar system, which they have already, you can imagine going to it with a spacecraft and um, taking a sample of the material and studying it because it's literally from an, an extrasolar system. It's from an exoplanetary system. And in fact, the European Space Agency has already greenlit a project to do just that. I think in 2025, they're launching um, and they're, they're literally planning on intercepting um, an interstellar asteroid or comet as they pass through the solar system to take material from it and study it um, in situ. People have already done that with solar system asteroids and comets, right? NASA has the, what's called the OSIRIS-REx mission, which is literally just taking a piece of the dust on an asteroid and bringing it back to Earth so we can understand um, more about the origin of asteroids. We could do the same thing, except this will be for extrasolar asteroids and extrasolar planetary systems. So that's really exciting. And I think this is the future of interstellar object um, science. So that's kind of all I have to say. Um, I'm happy to answer questions and um, thanks for your interest in signing on to listen to me give this talk. Well, thanks, Tim. That was a fantastic talk. I learned a lot of stuff uh, and there are a lot of questions. Okay. So I hope you're ready, okay? Uh, our first one is from the pre-talk questionnaire. And the person asked, uh, why is it that we find such diverse compositions in the solar system for both planets and moons? So we have the rocky planets that are close to the sun and then gaseous planets, but then Jupiter has all these moons. Some of them are icy, uh, not at all like the moon of the earth. So what's going on? Is It can't just be the distance from the sun, right? No, on some level it is, uh, but there's a lot more going on than just that. That's correct. Um, so yeah, how to start. I mean, people have been um, the past five-ish years, like I said, people have been really starting to look at protoplanetary disks in detail. Uh, if I go back to the slide where I show um, this disk here, this is from ALMA, right? Like I said, and people, since they've been getting this, these great telescopic images, they've been starting to think um, more carefully about the chemistry that goes on in protoplanetary disks. So the chemistry that can influence um, what kind of chemical compositions planets have once they form out of the disk. But it's very difficult. Uh, it's a very, very difficult question to answer because you can only look on so many, um, I won't get too technical. You can only look at so many chemicals that might be emitting light from the disk. So you don't know, uh, you can't directly tell what the composition of a disk is. Um, you have some idea, but it's difficult to get detailed measurements. So the reason why the compositions change um, is I wouldn't say it's a closed question. It's, it's an open question in the field, what kind of chemistry makes up protoplanetary disks and where you might expect to find different chemicals uh, as a function of the location in the disk. Um, disks are, are very tricky to understand. It's a, it's a really um, important, but very difficult question to answer in detail. So that's something people are still thinking about. There is no clear cut answer. Very good. Well, that's a pretty good start to have an answer there. Yeah. Uh, some <laughs> questions about the, um, transiting method for discovering exoplanets. So the first one is, how can we tell by looking at the dip in brightness if the planet is large or is it close? Or on the other, uh, vice versa, if it's small or if it's just far away from the sun or from the star? Yeah, so it depends on the, the system you're looking at. Um, so if you're looking at a, let's, let's just play this image, right? So you can, so let's say, uh, you have a, a transit that you know of, like let's just say there's, there's a Jupiter here, right? And you have a, a system that you're looking at that's transiting. There's, there's other um, 
ways of telling the distance to a star other than just looking at, um, let's say, the, 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 the transit data that you have. You can look at parallax. This is what, what we call parallax. This is what Gaia is doing. Gaia is recording the parallax. It's a, basically a, a geometric way of determining how far a star is away from you. And so actually there's a large database of distances to stars that we know of, not from looking at exoplanets, but just from measuring um, using other telescopes like Gaia. So typically there's other ways to tell other than just uh, looking at data that you have from your transit method. So you can already tell what the distance is, then you can figure out what kind of planet size you have because you know how far away it is. Okay, very good. And the other question related to the transiting method is, um, so we can only see the planets that are or, uh, transiting in our line of sight. Yeah. So is it possible that we're just missing a ton of planets because their orbit is not aligned with how we view the star? Yeah, that's right. I mean, you can't see what you can't see. So if a planet doesn't pass in front of the star along your line of sight, you're not going to see it. This is typically where other methods of uh, exoplanet discovery come in, like the radio velocity method. If you can't see the planet, but you can see that the star is periodically uh, moving closer and further away and closer to you, that can tell you that there's a planet there that's nudging the, pl the, the star in a certain way. So this is typically where you rely on a different method of exoplanet discovery than transit, because like you said, transit is limited in what it can see. So it's good that we have many methods then. Yeah. And speaking of methods, someone's asking, is AI, artificial intelligence, used at all in the field of exoplanets? It is. Yeah, it is. Um, this is something I wish I was better at, because AI is, I think, very important, <laughs> especially as we get more and more observational data. Um, people are really starting to invest a lot of time in trudging through terabytes and terabytes of telescopic data that are being collected, um, especially with, with new telescopes that are launching, they're, they're gonna be giving us absolutely humongous data sets that it's gonna be very difficult to parse through unless you have some kind of automated way to do that. So people are doing all kinds of things with AI. Um, the one that springs to mind is, um, I think people are using it for the transit timing variation method, um, but it, yeah, I mean, there's a lot. Pretty much AI is open-ended uh, where you can apply it. So I'm sure there's people thinking about pretty much every area of exoplanets, you can use AI to do something important or something interesting. Great. So someone's asking about the Galaxy Zoo project. Um, did that have a significant contribution to the identification of exoplanets? I don't, it's not off the top of my head. I don't know about too much about Galaxy Zoo. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't, I, I don't have a great answer for that. Um, most of what we know about exoplanets is just from studying the galactic neighborhood, not even really the Milky Way in total, just kind of our, our small corner of the galaxy. Um, so not at the top of my head, but I don't have a great answer for that, unfortunately. I don't know enough about galaxies here. That's okay, we can keep that for a future public lecture. Maybe. Yeah. Okay, so another question, uh, maybe that's one a bit, uh, bit tougher. So uh, in protoplanetary disks, well, you have these disks, right? Mm -hmm. But in previous public lectures, we've heard of other systems in astrophysics that also have these accretion disks, like black holes, for example. Yeah. And these disks, they stay there, right? They're not making any planets, uh, as, far, uh, as far as I know, at least. Okay, and yeah. when we've seen the image of the black hole, the big orange thing, what we're seeing is a disk. So mm -hmm. it, now in this case, in protoplanetary disks, how do we go from these rings or these disks to planets? Why isn't it stable? <clears throat> Why isn't it stable? Um, well, I guess I'll say a few things. <clears throat> the first thing is um, disks in astrophysics are a very natural consequence of um, minimizing energy. So when stars form, the gas that's left over minimizes energy and you get a disk. And similar uh, processes happen around black holes. It's not the same, you're not forming stars, but it's kind of a similar principle. So that's why they're kind of everywhere in a lot of different contexts. Um, and what was the second part of the question? Why do we form? Why, why aren't they stable, right? Yeah, why do disks in protoplanetary disks eventually make planets? Okay, yeah, so this is also another open question. So basically, I think the idea is that disks are fluids and that's kind of a physics term. What that means is you can get um, what are called instabilities. This might get a little bit technical, but there's ways of, of conglomerating dust particles together, basically, right? So they're kind of, they're streaming past each other on their orbits. This is kind of at a microphysical scale, right? This is a very small scale. And as they stream past each other, there's ways of conglomerating um, dust particles together. And as you start to conglomerate them, you kind of grow in size, you double in size periodically as you start to um, conglomerate more and more matter together. 
And this is a very, very um, difficult process to understand because there's a lot of changes in, in size you have to go from. You have to go from microphysics size to you know, like micron size to huge balls of matter that are um, you know, hundred, maybe hundreds of Earth masses large. Um, so basically the fundamental idea is that it's, it's a fluid physics problem with many, many steps in between that we do not fully understand. A lot more work to do. Yes, a huge number, a huge amount of work. <laughs> okay, so more questions. Let's keep going. Um, do you have any comments about Planet Nine, this mysterious planet that some people think is in the solar system, disrupting the gravity of some of the outer planets? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I'm really not an expert on Planet Nine. Uh, as far as I know, um, I mean, it's not impossible, like it's plausible, but that's really all you can say at this point. I, I think there's there's kind of you know kind of tentative, indirect evidence that there could be something there, <clears throat> but it's not um, clear cut at all at this point. So I think uh, the community certainly the community is not, as far as I know, is not um, convinced. But they're also not completely um, you know it's it's you have to entertain the idea. And it's plausible. So it's an open question right now. I think just we have to look for longer time. Maybe in ten years we'll have like a a better idea. 10 years to find a planet that's... Maybe, I, I really don't know. I'm not an expert though. Yeah, I don't know. That's okay. Okay, here's an interesting question. Um, how can we accurately predict where these interstellar objects came from? Because there's so many things around, so many things that could affect the gravitational mm -hmm. uh, field. So how can we, in those movies you showed, you showed a very uh, clear trajectory. How do we know that? Yeah, that's a good question. So <clears throat> really it depends. Uh, ultimately, it's going to be a question of um, the age of the interstellar object. So if it was ejected recently, you have a, a chance of maybe cleanly figuring out where it might have come from. Uh, if it was ejected, I mean, it seems like the vast majority of interstellar objects are probably ejected billions of years ago. So you have no chance of figuring out where they come from. But what's interesting is that Oumuamua um, seemed possibly to be young which was not what we expected. You would expect if you were to sample a random person in like New York City, you wouldn't get a baby, right? You, you get some random average age person, but instead the first interstellar object that we discovered seemed to be like anomalously young, like ejected in the past couple hundred, maybe tens of millions of years. The galaxy is like, you know, tens of uh, 10 gig a year, 10 billion years old. So this is meant uh, a lot younger than the galaxy. So it seems plausible. You could maybe figure out where one of these things might come from if it's young. And it's plausible that it seems like maybe it's, they're more common than we think, young interstellar objects, because we seem to have found one um, right off the bat. We don't know if it's young. I mean, that's, it seems like there are indications that it's young, but we don't know for sure. So at this point, it's kind of speculative, but uh, maybe things will firm up in like five years once um, the Vera Rubin telescope comes online. We have a large, much larger sample size. Great. Okay, so now it's time, uh, Tim, as our resident exoplanet expert and interstellar object expert, to answer some questions about aliens. Okay. <laughs> so the first one, there's this concept called the Fermi paradox, uh, which basically says, in principle, the probability that uh, other civilizations might exist in the galaxy, those probabilities are quite high, and yet we haven't seen anything, right? So where do you stand yourself on the Fermi paradox? Um... Yeah, I, you know, it's, yeah. Um, hmm, that's a good question. I mean, I don't have a great, uh, I don't have a firm belief or a firm opinion on it really. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I, I think uh, habitability is extremely interesting when you're thinking about planets and the galaxy. But I just think our, our level of ignorance on just like what even life is, we don't even understand biology. So. I mean, how do we, how can we even quantify the odds of finding another form of biology somewhere when we don't even understand what it really is? I, it just seems, um, yeah, I don't have a great opinion. I don't have a strong opinion on it. Um, yeah, I wish I did. I have a more interesting answer, I guess. But. Maybe what's paradoxical is that we can predict the trajectories of interstellar objects that we can barely see, but we don't understand biology, <laughs> which is right here. Not, yeah, that's true. It is, that is strange, yeah. Okay, now the other alien question is obviously that I'm sure people have heard Oumuamua has made the rounds everywhere in all the media because people were claiming maybe it's aliens, maybe it's an alien spaceship 
even some scientists were claiming that. So can you tell everyone uh, why is it that pe some people thought that and where does that issue stand today? And you can tell us yourself, Tim, uh, is it likely that Oumuamua is an alien spaceship? Okay, so I'll just go back. Um, I'll go to a slide where I showed a Muamua. So on the left is a Muamua, right? This kind of uh, pancake shaped. So there's a few reasons why it really puzzled astronomers when it, when it was discovered in 2018 or 17, one, a few years ago, not that long ago. One reason was because um, when you look at how the, the brightness changed through time, when it passed through the solar system, you can infer based on how the brightness changes, what kind of shape it must have. And at the time, people, um, some of the early estimates indicated that the shape would have been like a cigar. So not what I'm showing here, would have been like a, a thin kind of cigar shape, like a pencil shape almost, which tumbled, which means it's rotating in some strange orientation, which was strange. And that's really weird, right? A cigar shaped asteroid, they're supposed to be like spherical or something, right? Since then, people have uh, firmed it up and it's more of like a pancake shape, like I've shown here. But even that's kind of strange, right? It's kind of, there's two long axes, but there's one really short axis. Um, so that puzzled people. And that made people think, well, maybe, you know, if, this is, if it's a cigar shape, that's kind of similar to a spaceship, right? You'd expect a spaceship to be sort of cigar cylindrical. There are other, other reasons too. One reason was because um, what we call anomalous acceleration. So as we watched a Muamua pass through the solar system, we noticed that it was accelerating. It was speeding up or slowing down or either one. Um, comets usually do that. That's not a surprise, but you can usually see what is making the comet accelerate. It's usually outgassing, right? It's getting heated up and ice is on the surface and volatiles are getting thrown off and it's speeding or slowing, or slowing up the, um, the asteroid, it's accelerating. But for a Muamua, we saw the acceleration, but we didn't see any outgassing. There was nothing on it, it looked like a rock. So that made people think, okay, if it's accelerating, there must be some kind of like propellant or something, right? Because it's not, there's no ices coming off the surface. So that was another reason. There's a few other ones too. It seemed to be young, like I said, for, for technical reasons, people thought, and people still think, I still think it seemed kind of young. And that's strange. You wouldn't expect, like I said, to, to go to a random person in New York City and find that they're a baby, right? But we basically just found this extremely young object. Maybe, we don't know if it's young, but that's one, it's an indication. So there's a few different like paradoxical, paradoxical weird things people had um, really been publishing a lot of papers on and, and debating in the literature. Now, basically we know, at least I, as far as I'm concerned, it's kind of a case closed scenario where it seemed to be probably um, have quite a bit of nitrogen ice on the surface. And for technical reasons, nitrogen ice basically alleviates all of these issues. You're not gonna see it out gas if it's, getting, if it's getting ejected off the surface and heating up. You're not gonna see that with a telescope. Um, nitrogen ice is prevalent in the solar system. It's, there's, Pluto, for example, has lots of nitrogen ice. So it's not a surprise that you could have some kind of asteroid with nitrogen ice on it or, or a comet with nitrogen ice. A few other reasons, but that's basically it. So there's, there was just, this was just published um, maybe a month ago or, or a month and a half ago. This is a brand new result. But as far as I'm concerned, it's the best, most consistent and plausible or uh, explanation for the strange things that we observe with the Muamua. Um, so that's my opinion. I think a natural, a natural hypothesis explanation that is uh, we've seen something like it before in nitrogen ice on the surface of Pluto. It resolves the problems plausibly. It's natural, it doesn't require something exotic. I mean, all these things, in my opinion, basically answer all the questions about Oumuamua. Not all of them, but the, the really anomalous ones. Um, yeah, so it, I mean, think what you want, but aliens- Right answer, yeah. Effective hypothesis. And someone just wants to, you to clarify, does Oumuamua has an atmosphere? Not quite. No, not an atmosphere. It's actually devoid. It seems like it's devoid of gas. What I mean is that it has ices on the surface, nitrogen ice. So it's kind of a rocky, you can think of a, a comet, basically kind of a, like a rocky snowball. So it has rock intermixed with, with ice of some sort. In this case, uh, a significant fraction of, of nitrogen ice, uh, which gets heated up, but you can't see that with telescopes. So it's not, it's not an atmosphere. It's what we call a coma, basically a, a shell of, of gas being off-gassed, evaporated off the surface of the, of the body. And it's small. So an atmosphere around an object of a Muamua size doesn't work. A Muamua is something like a few hundred meters or like maybe a kilometer large or something like that. So it's not a large object. 
Okay, so Leah is sending me one last question. Um, okay, uh, not shying away from hard questions. So who funds studies like this in general? Is it the government? Is it private agencies? Depends on what studies. So what, what part of the talk? Exoplanets or interstellar objects? Well, I guess it's kind of a general question. And maybe, maybe let's say exoplanets, exoplanet research. Well, exoplanets, it's mostly major space organizations. NASA did, NASA funded Kepler. So NASA sent Kepler up in 2009. It funded the entire telescope. It made all the data publicly available for scientists um, to study. So it's, it's NASA that did, that did a lot of the exoplanet work. It's NASA that's going to continue doing it with the Nancy Grace Roman telescope. Interstellar objects, it was also um, PanSTARRS, I think, is also national. It's American. It's a big American telescope. Um, so it's mostly governments that are doing it. It's mostly uh, major space organizations or national governments that are doing telescopic uh, funding. OK, cool. So we're out of time. Um... If you want, maybe, can you just tell us uh, as non-exoplanet researchers and everyone, general population, what should we be most excited about from your perspective in this field of research? Is it exoplanets? Is it interstellar objects? Is it alien life in the, say, the next five years? Oh, hello? Uh, I hear Simon. Does, uh, does Tim hear Simon? Yes. Okay. Yeah, any last comments? Nope. <laughs> I think you might be freezing out, Tim, so. Okay, well, let's, let's just stop here. Apparently we're having some connection issues, but that was a great talk. Thank you so much, Tim, for answering all the questions. Thanks everyone for attending and asking the questions. And we'll see you next time for our next public lecture. Thanks everyone.